So this is my, my first reappearance in Auburn after five years of COVID madness. <laughs> and uh, I thank uh, my old friends, uh, Lou and Tom and Joe for the invitation. And also, of course, Stefan Kinsella and the Morins, who had been regular attendees at my annual property and freedom salon that we hold for almost, my wife and I operate for almost 20 years in Bodrum in Turkey. Um, 1949, as we have already heard, was an important date in a bad sense and in a good sense. Bad sense, it was the date when NATO was founded. Uh, <laughs> And coming to the good parts, it was also the date when human action appeared. And uh, it also happened to be the year when I was born. That was a good event for me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Not everyone might agree on that one, but uh, what can I say? Um, so I uh, think given my age, I'm also allowed to uh, use a few autobiographical uh, uh, events uh, that led me to the discovery of Mises and the discovery of Mises as a philosopher. Um, I started out in my intellectual development as a left-winger. Um, I have told this story repeatedly in more or less detail. I was one of those people who were later, until today, called out as members of the generation of the 1968ers. Um, that was a time of uh, the Vietnam War uh, and uh, the student protests all around the United States and also in, uh, in Europe. And uh, this generation, of course, is often blamed for the successive leftward turn of Germany uh, and through the march, through the institutions that was recommended by the Italian commie Gramsci. Um, and that still continues to this day, but with some signs appearing on the horizon that the end of this rope seems to be near. My main field of university study originally was philosophy, and my main teacher at the time was Jürgen Habermas, who was 20 years my older. Uh, he's still kicking around. Um, at that time, he was the young rising star of the famous Frankfurt School uh, of so-called critical theory. Um, the other big names uh, whose lectures I regularly attended were Max Horkheimer and Theodor Adorno. Both were Jews who emigrated to the United States and then returned to Germany after the war. Uh, Habermas was a Gentile. Um, it had nothing to do with immigration or anything like this. Uh, another uh, another important um, member of the Frankfurt School at that time uh, who did not return from the American emigration back to Germany but frequently gave lectures in Germany was uh, Herbert, Herbert Marcuse. Um, and I studied at the University of Frankfurt, the Goethe University of Frankfurt, which at that time, and I think even until today, was next to the University of Berlin, the Free University of Berlin, the center of, of left-wing thought. Um, I absorbed all of, or well, most of, the writings of the mentioned people, and uh, Jürgen Habermas, who from his early beginnings as an enfant terrible, uh, has in the meantime risen to the rank of one of the most famous and highly decorated philosophers, not only in Germany, 
but worldwide, and the high priest of political correctness, welfare statism, and US-led political centralization, he became my doctor father, my doctoral advisor. Uh, that happened in 1974, when I wrote my, finished my dissertation, so this is also the 50th anniversary um, that I received my PhD. Um, by that time in 1974, I was still somewhat of a left winger, but already considerably more moderate. And my dissertation had nothing whatsoever to do with political philosophy. It was a critique of empiricism, in particular, the philosophy of David Hume, from a rational or rationalistic point of view, if you will. It was some variation on and off the long lasting and still ongoing debate, or sometimes it's just a monologue, between the largely Anglo-Saxon empiricist philosophical, philosophical tradition represented most famously by John Locke and then by David Hume, and the continental rationalistic tradition as prominently presented by Leibniz and then by Immanuel Kant. Um, there's not much to say about this now, except that this study created in me some fundamental intellectual predisposition that would later immediately attract me to Mises' work as an outstanding example of rationalist thought, in contrast to the logical empiricists that were gathered around the famous Vienna School or the Vienna Circle, with whom Mises was, of course, intimately familiar. Uh, I'll come back to this topic a bit more later on. Meanwhile, successively and systematically expanding my readings beyond mostly leftist lit literature, I moved increasingly more rightward, conservative, and pro-market. I encountered first Milton Friedman, who was frequently mentioned at the time in the German newspapers and magazines as an intellectual big shot in the United States and the most famous champion of American capitalism and became some vaguely defined free marketeer. But as a philosophical rationalist, I also recognized early on the various inconsistencies and logical gaps in Friedman's arguments. From Friedman then, I found my way to Hayek, who actually lived and taught in Germany at the time, but curiously, he was, if I remember correctly, mentioned less frequently than uh, Friedman, for instance, despite having just in 1974 been awarded the Nobel Prize. Hayek further strengthened my newfound conviction. Still, I found him even less strict and consistent, or rather more confused, in his political philosophy than Friedman, not so much in his economics, which I was to encounter only and read only much later. But on the other hand, Hayek struck me as far more impressive with his wide-ranging interdisciplinary knowledge than the narrowly specialized Friedman. And now, from there on to Mises. Of course, I had heard his name before by now. Interesting, however, while he was never mentioned in West German economic textbooks, his name figured prominently in commie East Germany. Because most of my relatives lived in the East, my parents were both refugees from there, we went there every year for various visits of relatives. For that, you were always compelled to exchange West marks for East marks at a government-regulated exchange rate. Um, but then, since we stayed with relatives, you had to find something to buy for your East marks. And there was not much to buy. There were the collected works of Marx and Engels, and I still, in my library, I have all 40 volumes of that. <laughs> and uh, all the other heroes of socialism, 
you could get some Russian literary literature, literature uh, in German translation. You could get some records of classical music. And of course, also some of the current textbooks on political economy used in the East. And there, in one of such textbooks then, you could also find some detailed criticism of Western so-called bourgeois economics and economists, among them Friedman, Hayek, but in particular also of Mises, who was singled out as the most wrong-headed, dangerous, and detestable of all of these bourgeois thinkers. <laughs> Still, until the 1970s, late 1970s, I had not actually read anything by Mises. This changed only when I began serious work on my habilitation thesis, that is like an advanced doctoral degree, uh, on the methods and methodology of the social sciences. In the course of this, I also took a closer look in particular at economics as a special field within the general area of the social sciences. And there I came across also statements such as the quantity theory of money, first only in its quasi-mechanical version, without Cantillon effects and all the complications and so forth. Uh, I would learn about that only later on. According to which, an increase in the money supply leads to a reduction in the purchasing power per monetary unit. For me, it was obvious that this statement is a logically true statement, which cannot be falsified by any empirical data, and nevertheless a statement with a clear reference to reality and about real things. And as a philo philosopher in the rationalist continental tradition, there was nothing strange or unfamiliar for me with the idea of a synth synthetic a priori proposition. This is a terminology used by Kant and is also a terminology that Mises uses. Um, but wherever I looked in the contemporary literature, whether on the left at, by Paul Samuelson or on the right by Milton Friedman, the entire guild of economists was, to put it bluntly, in love with the Viennese philosophy of logical positivism or of Popperianism. Popper was belonged on the side also to this group. According to which such apodictically true statements saying something about the real world are impossible or scientifically inadmissible. For them, this statement was instead either a mere tautology, that is, a definition of words made up of other words, that is, a linguistic convention without any reference to reality, or it was a hypothesis that needed to be tested, either had to be verified by induction or that needed to at least be falsifiable. I was at first dumbfounded by this, but then, I do not remember exactly where, I found a reference in a footnote in one of Hayek's writings um, to Mises as one, as one of his own mentors, but as representing a different strand of the Austrian school than Hayek's own strand. And he mentioned in particular Mises' human action as the outstanding example of this different tradition. Um, in his view, in Hayek's view, this hyper-rationalistic strand that argued for economics, or what Mises then called pra praxeology, which at that time was a term I never heard of before, um, was some sort of discipline offering and made up of a prioristic propositions. Now that sounded exactly what I was looking for. At the time, I happened to spend a semester at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And the next day then, I went to the university library to obtain a copy of the book. Thus, 
Human Action then was my very first book of Mises that I read. I had devoured the whole volume in just two or three days and then immediately ordered my own copy of it in the local bookstore. The book was, I thought, and I still think so, except for some later additions made to it by Rothbard, in my view it was in a different league than anything offered by Friedman and Hayek. And it turned me into a radical free marketeer, but not yet into an anarchist. That came a little bit later. Um, indeed, it was a double revelation. It was, on the one hand, it was a systematic and comprehensive presentation of all of economics. And it was, at the same time, a confirmation of what I had come to conclude myself before about the nature and the epistemological status of economic propositions. It was, in a sum, to sum it up, it was a comprehensive presentation of economics as a system of propositions that were neither just linguistic conventions nor propositions open to falsification or in need of empirical verification by the collection of data. Contrary to all the pronouncement by seemingly everybody else within the economics profession, who claimed such propositions as impossible or rather as scientifically illegitimate. At the conclusion of my presentation here, I will offer you a short battery of such propositions to give you a flavor of it. But before that, I want to return very briefly, and I promise briefly, to the subject of philosophical rationalism versus empiricism that I have mentioned before. That is, the Mises as a philosopher part of the title of my lecture. For me, it was part one of human action that attracted my greatest interest. The very part that I have been told that Randians or Randroids are asked not to, not to read uh, or skip over. Um, I don't know why they do that. I think because subjectivism appears frequently there and they, of course, are, as you know, objectivists. Um, Rand, I should, as a side remark, uh, Rand was completely unknown in Europe when I was studying. In the meantime, that has changed a little bit. Um, but in the intellectual development of most Austrians, libertarians in Europe, Rand played no no role whatsoever. And I was surprised also to find out later on that even though Rand has always been hailed as the hero of individualism, uh, she, she is also a proponent of uh, collective, collective guilt and collective punishment. So roughly the very opposite of what an individualist is. Uh, I'm always surprised that libertarians never seem to emphasize this very much and are still largely and greatly in love with her. Um, in any case, others considered that part rather superfluous. I remember Murray Rothbard once returning from a conference at Stanford, and he had met Kenneth Arrow at that conference, and they must have talked also about this book. And uh, Arrow uh, confessed to Rothbard that uh, he couldn't make out uh, heads or tails of what that first part of the book was all about. And, uh, and I know that Joe Salerno, in one of his writings, warned also the younger Austrians, the novices, among the Austrians, that they should not concern themselves too much with that part, with that part one. Uh, since I'm already older than Joe Salerno, at least by one year, uh, <laughs> I guess I, I have permission uh, to ignore his to ignore his advice. 
Um, it, and that part was of particular interest for me uh, because Mises there writes about the subject of the ultimate given and the ultimate foundation of economics. Um, the question of how to begin philosophy and how to put our knowledge on firm grounds is almost as old as philosophy itself. And Mises made an important contribution to it. And I, inspired by my earlier study of several German rationalist philosophers, of the, on the one hand of the Frankfurt School, and on the other hand, even more importantly, of the so-called Erlangen Konstanz Marburg School, uh, have tried here and there to clarify and add to his solution. I am still not entirely satisfied with it all and will here only offer some bricks and cut some corners then, rather than a complete building. But inshallah, if God wills, there will be still more force coming. And I should make you aware of my latest installment on this problem which appeared in, I think, the most recent issue of the quarterly journal of Austrian economics titled The Proper Study of Man. So whoever is interested in these philosophical problems, he might want to take a look at that article. Incidentally, these two traditions, the German rationalist schools and uh, and the Mises school that I try to integrate appear to be entirely unaware of each other, although they run largely parallel in time. And interestingly, politically, they are far apart. The German philosophers, at least of the younger generations, are mostly mathematicians or natural scientists, essentially unfamiliar with economics, and typically, as is the case almost everywhere in, in academia, they were some sort of social democrats. Um, now, Descartes, as you have all heard, claims his famous cogito ergo sum as the certain foundation of knowledge. The empiricists, such as Locke, claim, on the other hand, that it is sense impressions that are at the bottom of our knowledge. And Mises considers the fact that humans act purposefully as the ultimate given. And people like Popper deny that any such ultimate starting point exists and that any attempt of searching for it will end in some infinite regress. Now, a little reflection shows that none of this will quite do because all of these proposals come in the form of words, in the form of language and of propositions. We speak and write in meaningful words and sentences about our self-consciousness, about our sense impressions, our actions, or about the infinite regress in our search for some ultimate foundation. Thus, unwittingly, and as a matter of fact, they will all have affirmed the existence of one and the same point of departure, namely language, whereby it is irrelevant whether it is English, German, Hopi, or whatever, any language. Now, for the sake of brevity, I will spare myself a detailed account of the praxeological implications of this fundamental insight, but just intuitively, a language, any language, is a public and common language. There is no such thing as a private language. Ludwig Wittgenstein has demonstrated that in great, in great detail. Um, so it's a public language spoken with and to be understood by other people for the very purpose of communication. It is a public tool that some people are good at handling and others bad at handling, helping us to move around in the social world by means of words alone. And second, that any language is learned and acquired by infant persons in interaction with older people. 
and that the correct use and understanding of words is exercised, tested, corrected, and demonstrated through the performance of specific actions and reactions in the real world, as well the learning and perfection of foreign languages occurs in real interpersonal interactions as well. Now, which brings me back to Mises and his claim of human action as the ultimate, a priori foundation of knowledge. Speaking and writing, all philosophizing, is done in language. There is no other beginning, and these activities, indeed, all communicating in meaningful words are themselves also actions. So Mises is ultimately right, but it is real actions and the success or failure of real actions that precede and provide the ultimate testing ground for all mere talk about actions. Action, that is, speak louder than words and serve as ground to verify or falsify words. Handwerk, working with your hands, provides the basis and the testing ground for Mundwerk, the babbling, just babbling about things. There is no infinite regress as far as our knowledge of men is concerned. Such is only the case as long as you stay exclusively within the realm of words. But once you recognize how words are tied to objects and get down to the level of real actions, all further questions disappear. You are on unmovable ground. You cannot ask for a justification of action as this question would itself be an action. Now, in the rationalist tradition, or rather in one of the rationalist traditions, a proposition is then considered ultimately justified if you cannot doubt it without falling into what is called a performative or dialogical contradiction. That is, if the, current, if the content of what you are saying stands in contradiction to what you are actually doing or claim to be doing. Thus, you cannot say, of course, that you cannot act or speak, but this would be contradicted by the very fact that you do what you say you cannot do. You can say a given person can be at two places at once or climb up and down the stairs simultaneously. That would not be logically contradictory, but it would entail a performative contradiction because you are not and cannot actually do so. You can say that some object has the property of A and of none A at the same time, but whenever actually dealing with that object, you cannot but treat it as either an A or a non-A, and never simultaneously as both. You can say that the rules of elementary logical reasoning, that is, the rules of using such terms as and and or, of one, of some, of all, and so on, are just linguistic conventions. But you cannot actually be treating them as such rather than as necessary or a priori without continuously falling, failing to reach your own goal. So if you say, I want a beer and a pizza, and you don't understand what and is, you make mistakes. You sometimes only get the pizza, and then you don't get the beer. Um, as well, you can say, of course, that the experience of action is derived from sense impressions. But there is no way to get from sense impressions to meaningful words and sentences. Those are completely different things. Sense impressions are not words. Rather, the making and reporting of sense observation, of sensory observations itself is an action 
and presupposes all categories or concepts implied in the notion of the purpose of the purposeful pursuit of some end or goal. Now enough of this digression and back more directly to Mises and human action. In any case, my little excursion into the field of the philosophy of language turns out quite useful to elucidate two fundamental distinctions made by Mises and his work. His twofold distinction or dualism between the natural sciences on the one hand and the sciences of acting men on the other. And when within this latter field of the study of acting men, the social sciences in general, the distinction between theory made up of apodictic or synthetic a priori propositions and history concerning the reconstruction of singular past events or the speculative anticipation regarding some specific future events. Put as briefly as possible, nature is everything or all objects with whom we cannot communicate and coordinate our actions by means of words and sentences or do so only in some metaphorical sense as when we talk to some animals. Obviously, we cannot talk to animals. We can, yeah, we can say words to them and they do perform certain things, but that is not a communication. As for such objects, we cannot know and never find out why they behave the way they do. They just do. There is no reason, no motive, and no purpose involved or to be discovered in nature or in natural evolution. There is no rhyme or reason to it. It just is what it is. All we can do here is looking for and discovering is causal relations, how to produce some specific result A by arranging some causes X, Y, and Z, and so on, in some specified way. Here, in this field then, the alleged great problem of rationalist philosophy, that is the infinite regress in the process of justification, makes at first intuitively a certain amount of sense because you can always and endlessly ask, but what about the cause of the cause? What is the cause of gravitation? Or what is the cause of the Big Bang? And what is the cause of that cause? But even that problem turns out to be, practically speaking, irrelevant. Because, as in particular the mentioned constructivist philosophers that I uh, mentioned before, the German tradition, from Hugo Dingler to Paul Lorenzen to Peter Janich have demonstrated, the natural sciences all rest on some technical a priori or technological a priori in the form of purposefully constructed measuring instruments of yardsticks, of clocks, and so forth. And thus, any regress here finds some quick practical end too. But this is not my topic here. The second mentioned distinction can also be readily explained. Every action, including all communication, can come out as a success or a failure. And whatever a person may hope, no one knows in advance what it will actually be. Thus, with every action, a new situation is created. The actor has learned something new and faces a new situation. Accordingly, there can be no general unchanging law of what it is that people will do. That is, the specific content of their actions can never be known. Put briefly, we can never know in advance all of the sorts of actions that people can or may be able to perform in the future. Can you predict, for instance, what sorts of products will be available for sale in 20 years from now? Um, and the answer is, of course, nobody can. Here we are left to historical reconstructions and narratives, respectively, 
or to speculations regarding the future. But what we can say with certainty is that regardless of whatever the specific actions of a person in this or that situation may be, for any and all cases it holds, every action turns out either successful or not. And this, then, is the unique epistemological status of praxeological laws. They are not propositions about, specific, about the specific content of the actions of specific actors in specific situations, but about the formal structure of all, each and every action by each and every actor and at all times, unchangeable, and unaffected by any future learning of his or any future change of circumstances. Let me, for the purpose of illustration, use an analogy here to the philosophy of language. We cannot predict all of the words or sentences that people will ever speak or write. Indeed, there are many different natural languages and people come up constantly with new words, and insofar, language may be considered just a convention. But each and every language, for instance, must make use of identifiers, that is, of proper names such as Peter or Paul, or words such as this and that, and it must make use of predicators, that is, of words asserting or denying certain properties of the identified object or person. Otherwise, we could not even produce the most elementary propositions such as this is such and such, as expressions of any experience whatsoever. There is no experience that does not make use of these sorts of words. It's a minimum requirement. Yet without the use of elementary propositions, such as this is such and such, then no meaningful communication whatsoever between people could be possible. Let me co quote Paul Lorenzen, who was one of the leaders of this German rationalist school that I mentioned, to this effect. He writes, the decision to use elementary ways of speaking is not a matter of argument. It does not make sense to ask for an explanation or to ask for a reason. For to ask for such things demands a much more complicated use of language than the use of elementary sentences itself. If you ask such questions, in other words, you have already accepted the more elementary use. And he further explains then, each proper name, proper name or identifiers, this or that, uh, is a convention because I know many sounds I could use instead. But to use proper, me pro proper names at all is not a convention. It is a unique pattern of linguistic behavior. Therefore, I'm going to call it logical. The same is true with predicators. Each predicator, that is, this is such and such, each predicator is a convention. This is shown by the existence of more than one natural language. But all languages do use predicators. This is a logical feature of our linguistic behavior. Now, let me make the point here. There are some philosophers, we start with axioms. But what this shows here, these are not just axioms that we somehow assume. These are necessary axioms. Without, there is no way that you can start without these sorts of things. So there are necessary axioms. So when we say Mises starts with the axiom of action, that is somewhat incorrect. It is, is indeed the ultimate foundation, the ultimate axiom. No other axiom could be chosen. I trust that you immediately recognize the parallel between this intellectual enterprise of reconstructing 
and formulating a universal logic, which is what these German rationalist philosophers do, the logic of speaking and thinking as such, that is regardless and totally abstracted from any specific content of speech or thought or from any specific language whatsoever. And let me add in parenthesis that great advantages have been made in the meantime in this endeavor by these German philosophers, going far beyond the just cited first beginning with elementary propositions. And the parallel of this and Mises' enterprise of reconstructing and formulating a universal logic of action of what he called praxeology. That is, the laws of acting as such, regardless of its specific content. Now, interestingly, by the way, both intellectual traditions, the representatives of the mentioned German philosophical rationalists, as well as Mises, and the practitioners of this praxeologi his praxeological method and analysis are today largely considered, both of them, outsiders in their respective fields. For the German philosophers, in the field of the philosophy of science, they are outsiders there. This is dominated by empiricists who don't believe in any of this stuff. Um, and, and in Mises's case, he is a comp the praxeologists are considered to be outsiders in the field of economics. As intellectuals, they are outsiders, both of them, because as intellectuals who uphold the idea that there are universal, non-falsifiable truths, and there is in the, er in the area of thinking and in the area of acting, they are, because of their view, considered to be troublemakers, if you will, in an intellectual environment dominated by almost child an almost childish form of empiricism and of relativism. But now then, without further ado, and as promised, just a few examples of praxeological insights for the purpose of illustration, and thereby then also come to an end, finally. Um, whatever a man may do, we know for sure that he does so for a reason and with a purpose. That is, with some anticipated future state of affairs in mind. We know that whatever he does, he does so with means thought to be suitable to reach some ends. And we know all of this with apodictic certainty or a priori in so far as we cannot possibly dispute such knowledge without thereby actually affirming its truth. Namely, in that its denial is itself a purposeful goal-directed action. And all the while we can never scientifically predict the specific content of our own or our fellow men's actions, that is, our specific choices of ends and means in some continuously changing environment, based on our a prioristic knowledge concerning the formal structure of all of human action, we can derive an impressive number of equally a prioristic or universally valid conclusions. These conclusions are either directly implied in the concept of action, or else they are conclusions reached indirectly in conjunction with some explicitly stated initial empirical and empirically verifiable conditions or premises so as to allow us to also make some apodictic or non-falsifiable predictions of central importance concerning the social world, provided only that these initial conditions are indeed met and fulfilled. I shall present only a few examples of such propositions. You have already heard some here in the course of these previous lectures, I'm sure, uh, to give you a flavor of their epistemological status as well as their practical importance. We do not know all potential human goals. 
but we do know for certain that whatever they may be, they are supposed to bring about an improvement in an actor's well-being. And we do know for certain that wherever and whenever a person does what he does, he always does so because he considers this, in this situation, his most highly valued of his most urgently needed goal or end. We do not know all potential means employed by men in his activities, but we do know for certain that whatever is used as a means by an actor derives its value as a good for him from the value that he attaches to the very end or goal that it is supposed to help bring about. As well, while we cannot predict the changes in the subjective value attached to various ends, we can predict with certainty that a higher or a lower value attached to some given goal, whatever it is, will also raise or lower the value of the means necessary or the means or goods used to produce this goal and that the discovery of the suitability of certain means for more and additional goals, for instance, will increase the value of such means. Moreover, while we cannot know or scientifically predict what things or entity may ever be used as a means or a good by men, we know for sure that for everything ever considered a good by an actor, it holds that more of such a good is preferred by him over less. As well, we know for sure that as more and more units of some goods, of some given good are added to our supply, the less is the value attached to a unit of such good because this good can only be employed for the satisfaction of increasingly lower ranked or less urgent ends or needs. This is the law of diminishing marginal utility. We cannot predict scientifically what sorts of goods or products men will ever produce and what sorts of goods or products we may ever consume. But we know for sure that there can be no consumption without prior production and we can also be certain that whatever is consumed today cannot be consumed again tomorrow. As well, we know with certainty that men cannot for any lengthy, lengthy time consume more goods than he produces unless he steals it from others and that it is only by way of savings in consuming less than what is produced that he can possibly increase his own prosperity. We cannot make safe and certain predictions concerning where, when, and what sorts of exchanges, uh, be it of material goods or immaterial ones, such as words or gestures, for instance, are to take place between various people. But we do know for sure that what for any voluntary exchange to take place it must hold that both parties to the exchange expect to be made better off by the exchange, that they evaluate the goods to be exchanged as of unequal value, and that they have an opposite preference order regarding the goods exchanged. As well, from the outset of human history, we cannot know what sort of thing is to become a money, that is a common medium of exchange, how long it is to maintain its status as money or what other things might replace as it as money in the future. But for any society exceeding the size of a single household and with a bare minimum of the division of labor, we can, based on our a prioristic knowledge concerning the universal structure of action, deduce and safely predict the emergence of some common medium of exchange because any direct exchange of goods or services requires a double coincidence of wants. I must want what you have and you must want what I have. And yet this obstacle and limitation of direct exchange can be overcome 
and conditions for an actor can be improved by means of indirect exchange. A person who cannot attain what he wants in direct exchange can increase his chances of getting what he ultimately wants if he succeeds in first acquiring a more marketable good than his own in exchange to be then more easily saleable for the ultimate thing that he wants. This practice further increases the marketability of the very good in question and stimulates others to follow this example. Thus, step by step, via rationally motivated imitation, a common medium of exchange is to emerge, a money, originally, of course, a commodity money, as the most easily saleable and most widely accepted good. And as such, clearly to be distinguished in its function from both producer and consumer goods. With money come money prices, price comparisons, and economic calculation. And there is nothing to be known with certainty about future money prices paid for this or that, about future price comparisons, or about future business calculations. But again, there are some things that we do know for certain. For instance, if the quantity of money is increased, the purchasing power per money uni is reduced below what it otherwise would be. An increase in the quantity of money cannot increase overall social wealth, as an increase in producer and consumer goods would, but only lead to a redistribution of wealth to the advantage of the money producers. Economic calculation requires that you can compare the input of production with the output of production to determine whether or not less valuable means were transformed into more valuable means, as intended. For such a comparison to be possible, there must be money prices for all factors of production as, uh, as well as for all final, pro final goods. Under old-style socialism, with all means of production owned and controlled by one central committee, no input factor prices exist, and hence economic calculation under socialism is impossible. We can also know for sure, by a law of marginal utility, that if the price for some good is increased or decreased, and everything else is assumed to remain constant, that is a ceteris paribus assumption, then either the same quantity or less, or either the same quantity or more will be bought. And we know just as surely that prices fixed above market prices, such as minimum wages, for instance, will lead to some unsaleable surpluses, that is to forced unemployment, whereas prices fixed below market clearing prices, such as rent ceilings, will lead to shortages, that is, to persistent shortages of rental housing. And we know as well with certainty that if any of these predictions happen to fail in some particular instance, this would not be because of an error in our logically deduced conclusion, but because the ceteris paribus assumption had not been bet in a particular case under consideration and we would have to look for some significant changes in an actor's empirical circumstances in order to account for the observed seeming anomaly. No experience or so-called empirical evidence can ever falsify beat or trump praxeology and logic. But praxeology and praxeological reasoning can reveal that there is something wrong about some alleged experience or evidence. I could go on and on with further examples of apodictic propositions, that is, of propositions that can be begriffen, that can be conceptually grasped. But I'm quite confident that the short list of examples that I have provided should suffice to demonstrate that they have some distinctly different epistemological status than what commonly under, is commonly understood as 
empirically falsifiable hypotheses. Now, looking from a methodological point of view at the current state of affairs in the social sciences, including economics, then two major and interrelated confusions can be readily diagnosed, both ultimately rooted in the typically unquestioning acceptance of some variant of empiricist philosophy among most practicing social and nearly all natural scientists. The first confusion concerns the widespread belief that things can be accomplished in the social sciences that simply cannot be accomplished, namely discovering laws. Contrary to the belief of many social researchers, especially like econometricians, there are no empirical laws, verified, confirmed, or not yet falsified by empirical data to be found and discovered within the realm of human action. Here, more humility is in order. One's research may still be interesting and relevant. I'm not saying that all of these things are nonsense, so to speak. Um, but they are not what most people claim they are. They are not discoveries of laws. They are, at the best, discoveries of relatively stable correlations that exist. But they are nothing else but historical regularities. And the second confusion, widespread in particular among economists, has just been addressed. It is the inability or the unwillingness of recognizing the categorical epistemological difference between apodictic or in Kantian lingo synthetic propositions on the one hand and empirical or a posteriori propositions on the other hand, I should mention that today, the year 2024, is also the 300th birthday of Immanuel Kant, who uh, was born in 1724. Uh, and again, uh, because uh, David Gordon said something about Mises uh, rejects uh, Kant, but not his epistemology. Uh, his epistemology he, he endorses. And, uh, and, I'm, and since uh, Kant's epistemology has also been ridiculed by some uh, Iranian people, I should uh, ask you, if you're interested, take a look at the uh, critique of pure reason of Kant and compare them with the writings of, uh, of uh, Ms. Rand or Mr. Peikoff, and th then the decision who is the greater philosopher is a rather easy one. Um, so as good empiricists who only recognize and only know of empirical laws apart from mass, they are increasingly often busy subjecting propositions that are deductively derived from some a priori true starting points to empirical tests. <laughs> there are people who refute the law, try to refute the law about minimum wages that I mentioned before by you know, looking at some cases where, where uh, the, the, the number of employment went up, but then circumstances, and there are people who, say, who try to show that the demand curve can move up move upward instead of downward. This is, this is, these are all, this is all nonsense research. Um, so they are occupied with uh, trying to test the untestable, and they try to falsify the non-falsifiable. And whatever insight may happen to spring from such misguided endeavors, it is overshadowed by the intellectual damage done and the confusion spread by the blatant category mistake undergirding and committed by any such research. So again, sociology is in uh, constant danger of thinking 
something is a law that is not a law. And the economists frequent, frequently think that something is a, a hypothesis, a falsifiable regularity, when it is, in fact, a logically necessary truth. And Mises is a person who can set us right in all of this and help us avoid these confusions that have invaded most of the social sciences. I thank you very much.